Let me know. Tonight's uh, event is titled Techno-Humanitarianism, Rethinking the Securitization and Victimization of Refugees. Uh, we are very lucky to have here with us Martina Tazioli, who is a lecturer in politics and technology at Goldsmiths, University of London. She is the author of The Making of Migration, The Biopolitics of Mobility at Europe's Borders, Spaces of Governmentality, Autonomous Migration and the Arab Uprisings, uh, published in 2015, and co-author with Glenda Gorelli of Tunisia as Revolutionized Space of Migration in 2016. She is co-editor of Foucault and the History of Our Present. Uh, oh, sorry, co-founder of the journal uh, Materiale Foucaultini and on the editorial board of the journal Radical Philosophy. Uh, our discussant tonight is Brenna Bander, uh, who is a senior lecturer here at SOAS in the law department. She has published widely in the areas of critical legal theory, sovereignty, and indigenous rights, contemporary disputes over ownership and property rights, amongst other themes. She is the author of Colonial Lives of Property, Law, Land, and Racial Regimes of Ownership, published in 2018 by Duke University Press. So, first we will hear from Martina. You want to go? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So, thanks a lot, Fezi, for this invitation that gives me the opportunity to um, speak about uh, my current research project and to have feedback on this. So what I uh, present today is part of a broader research project about uh, what might be called the financialization of refugee humanitarianism, that is to say the increased role played by financial actors such as banks in governing refugees. So very much has been written and said about the role of private actors and um, corporation in, um, in the enforcement of the border regime, but much less has been investigated uh, about the role of these financial actors and how they collaborate with humanitarian actors. Um, <clears throat> so this research project uh, that I have uh, done until now has, has, has focused on Greece, but I mean, we will... Uh, uh, expand also with other colleagues in the near future to other countries such as Jordan, Lebanon and the UK. Um, and the reason why uh, I'm interested in uh, discussing this project is because uh, it gives me the opportunity also to um, broadly uh, reflect on uh, the, 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 the new way in which, uh, the different way in which humanitarian actors um, <clears throat> operate on the ground uh, through the implementation, the widespread implementation of digital technologies in sites such as refugee camps. Uh, so also um, on this topic there has been, a, there is a quite growing literature in particular in the field of uh, critical migration studies and critical security studies about what authors have called techno-humanitarianism, right? And uh, my specific angle, my specific entry point in this uh, research is twofold. The first one is about how refugees, or better, asylum seekers, uh, people who try, and I will explain why, try to claim, to claim asylum, are shaped um, by this, the forced use of digital technologies in refugee camps. So unlike um, scholars who... Uh, seize the opportunity of digital technologies, of the widespread use of digital technology to say, okay, let's move beyond uh, a question on the subject and let's move towards uh, an inquiry center on uh, STS, science and technology studies, and how technology are used to track migrants. I rather use this, I rather focus on this transformation to investigate how subject themselves have been transformed, so subject in this case asylum seekers, uh, through this um, uh, multiple transformation of refugee humanitarianism. And secondly, I'm interested in the specific economy of knowledge which is at stake in refugee humanitarianism, and I think that uh, a lens, an insight into this techno-humanitarianism allows uh, looking even I mean, more in depth at uh, the way in which refugees are governed by, by being constantly disoriented. So uh, through what I call an obfuscated knowledge uh, that uh, they are affected by. So uh, even if a humanitarian actor promote this technology as a way for overcoming uh, the opacity 
in terms of what refugee knows or don't know and to streamline the refugee procedure, um, I will show in this lecture that actually this technology becomes an obstacle for the refugee themselves and contribute to uh, this kind of epistemic disorienting uh, that um, they are constantly affected by uh, during their um, um, asylum procedure. <clears throat> so let's start with a small vignette, short vignette from uh, Lesbos, January 7, 2019, Greek island of Lesbos. UNHR's officer are working 10 by 10 in the hotspot of Moria due to, to do the monthly verification and the top up of the prepaid cards given to asylum seekers who are eligible for the so-called refugee cash assistance program. According to the UNHCR, the program, and he will explain in a minute what it's about, I quote, restore dignity and empower asylum seekers and refugees. In meanwhile, few migrants were complaining about the lack of humanitarian support and infrastructures in the camp. At that time, uh, around 70,000 women, men, and children were living in a crowded hotspot of Moria. We have no water, and some areas of the camp, in some areas of the camp, there is no electricity either. We are all becoming mad, as some of us have been stranded here for one or more years. Uh, an Iranian man told me outside the camp. Then he added, now I have, I have to go back to my tent as the UNHCR is coming to top up my car. They informed me this morning with a text that I need to be there. I hope to be still eligible. My friend realized to be out of the scheme as he finally got the refugee status, but nobody told him how long he would receive the monthly financial support for. It's very difficult to understand how all this technology works. End of site quotation. So this snapshot from Lesbos where asylum seekers are given prepaid cards by humanitarian actors while they are exposed to uh, a, a condition of protracted precarity and vulnerability is iconic of the reality of techno-humanitarianism. The relationship between migrants on the one hand and humanitarian actors and Greek authorities on the other is fundamentally mediated by technological devices, some of which are compulsory. So there is this compulsory technological mediation that turn um, uh, asylum seeker into forced techno users. And I will explain in which sense. So I think that this, uh, I mean, the, the, the distribution of debit cards that I will uh, discuss more in detail later should be situated within uh, what might be called a constellation of technologies of refugee humanitarianism, which also include these financial tools, so the debit cards, that affect the daily life of asylum seekers and that mediate their relations with humanitarian actors um, on um, at, at different levels and uh, on a, um, of their asylum application. So first, migrants who apply for asylum become hindered for, for techno users as long as they need to navigate a, a, an heterogeneous technological ecosystem. Digital technologies are implemented in a way that obstruct migrant access to the asylum system and to financial support and that disorient migrants force him then to hectically find out uh, the, te the new technological rules they need to comply with. So for instance, just to give you an idea, a uh, concrete example, in order to uh, book an appointment with the Greek asylum service uh, on the mainland, on the Greek mainland, migrants need to uh, make this Skype uh, call um, that is very hard to make, not, not only for the Skype as such, that some people might not have or they might not have uh, internet, but also because this, this, this Skype number is constantly busy, right? Um, secondly, I suggest that the analytical grids of securitization and victimization are not fully adequate for grasping in depth how asylum seekers uh, as forced techno users are shaped and disciplined. So in the literature, in refu critical refugee studies and migration studies, um, <clears throat> there, is, uh, I mean, <clears throat> there is this attention paid to this articulation and mutual entanglements between modes of uh, securitizing migrants, so of presenting migrants as potential threat, as risky subject, and at the same time, uh, how the same migrants uh, in the same context or in different contexts might be perceived and treated as victims, as subject of pity. Uh, but I think that these, uh, these uh, analytics that has been mobilized so much in the literature uh, with expressions such as uh, subject of care and control that uh, in part capture indeed uh, most of the mechanisms that are at stake in a camp, uh, however, is not um, fully adequate to grasp all this transformation that 
have not been triggered by technology, but definitely uh, techno this insight on digital technology helps in highlighting uh, the, the current restructuring of refugee humanitarianism. The disciplinary mechanism enshrined in the functioning of technology in refugee humanitarianism contribute to craft asylum seeker not just as subject of care and control, but also as in their subject, which means that basically migrants are constantly obstructed in their attempt first to claim asylum, physically obstructed and technologically obstructed, uh, and also in the possibility of getting access to their rights and, for instance, also to financial and humanitarian support. Um, so I think that we need to complicate the representation of refugee as risky subject and subject at risk, that is a subject who are deemed to be potential threat to national security and who might alternatively be portrayed as victim to be protected. This constellation of technology and their changing rule contribute to, gover to uh, governing asylum seekers through uh, disorientation. And the focus on Greece, I think, is interesting not only because Greece is the first uh, Europe, uh, countries of the European Union where the European Commission implemented the refugee cash assistance program, but also precisely because it's not one of the most advanced countries in terms of technological experimentation. For instance, Jordan, the famous Zatari camp, uh, famous in the sense that it's well known for this uh, technological experimentation uh, implemented by the UNHCR, but precisely because there is this mix of widely promoted technologies such as the prepaid card and more ordinary ones like the Skype system but also WhatsApp and Viber chat uh, that, however, uh, constitute a real constellation of obstacles to the migrants that cannot be resolved through um, um, the lens of security. So these technology are not, the, the main point is not that this through this technology migrants are tracked, are controlled and monitored. This is also the case, but uh, I think that this is not the main uh, political and theoretical uh, state. Um, and however, so uh, scholars who have been trying to complicate this securitization and victimization narrative have ended up uh, recently, there, I mean there are the many articles that have been published, uh, published recently on that, uh, in uh, portraying the refugees as uh, the self-reliant subject, as the autonomous subject. Uh, so if you want, reproposing the same narrative that um, humanitarian actors, uh, such as the UNHCR, are crafting. Uh, and I think that, however, uh, looking at the refugees as this uh, uh, resilient and uh, subject who is entrepreneurs of himself is quite misleading if we look at the actual functioning of this technology. So uh, the first move that I think is important to make is precisely this, uh, moving out from an exclusive security gaze on migration and on refugees, so the fact that this technology should be are used for tracking migrants, and as I said, this is also the case in particular because when migrants are given these prepaid cards, they might be tracked in real time, both by the humanitarian actors and uh, by the bank, right? Uh, as we can, we, we can be tracked, right? Our financial transac uh, uh, trans uh, transaction, um, and also I mean, they, can, they can find out the exact location where migrants take cash, right? Um, and however, this is not the main goal of these humanitarian actors, not because they welcome migrants, but because there are other ways in which migrants might be tracked. So the fingerprints when they are uh, identified after landing. And also because it's interesting to notice that migrants are not only at least seen, and I think less and less seen um, in these sites, like in Italy and in Greece, or the frontiers of Europe, as potential threat as such. There is definitely also this aspect, and indeed uh, it's interesting to notice the increased cooperation between uh, the European agency Europol and the European agency Frontex inside the hotspots in Italy and in Greece. But at the same time, they are not, this is not the main representation. The main representation is refugees as a burden uh, to manage, and they are not even seen as victims, uh, or at least it's not so easy for a migrant to apply for asylum, who wants to apply for asylum in Italy and Greece at the moment, to be portrayed as a victim. 
Uh, and indeed, uh, both in Italy and in Greece, there is a huge struggle around uh, vulnerability. So only those who manage to uh, be recognized as highly vulnerable have this kind of preferential channels that uh, in Greece um, consist in being able to move from the island to the mainland. Uh, and uh, in Italy, uh, they have anyway as a kind of uh, facilitated access to, uh, to protection. And, but however, there is a whole struggle around uh, being considered and not being considered uh, vulnerable, and there, there are uh, many cases of non-recognized vulnerability, also very, I mean, blatant uh, vulnerability. Um, so uh, taking into account the use of digital technologies in the field of humanitarianism, um, UNHCR's program to announce refugees' resilience and entrepreneurship, so this is how the UNHCR presents all this, a growing scholarship has pointed to the affirmation of humanitarianism as a liberal diagnostic predicated upon refugee self-reliance and autonomy, so also criticizing this. But anyway, they take for granted this uh, narrative. The partial turn in humanitarianism stressed by these authors from refugees as victims towards refugees as self-reliant subject draws attention to how refugees can adapt to the, their new circumstances. The analytical grid of neoliberalism and its multi multiple articulations, such as resiliency, humanitarianism, refugees, entrepreneurship, however, it seems to me does not able to fully grasp the peculiar assemblages of disciplinary rule, repeated obstruction, and injunction to autonomy and technolo forced technological uh, mediation. Um, so what is this refugee cash assistance program? Um, that I mentioned at the beginning. In 2016, the European Commission launched the Refugee Cash Assistance Program, which was then fully implemented in 2017 as a response to the so-called refugee crisis. So this was the official uh, justification, the official uh, narrative. And this program consists in prepaid cards delivered to all asylum seekers, so all people who have a, uh, an asylum card in Greece, both on the mainland and on the island. Um, and actually, this cash assistance program was introduced not only as a humanitarian relief measure, but as a technical financial tool for enhancing refugees' dignity and freedom of choice by conceiving freedom of choice as a freedom to choose among different products that refugees might want to buy. So because with this card, you can go to the ATM machine and take cash and go to the shops. And okay, there are um, in multiple details and restrictions, but just to put it briefly, uh, what this program consists of. Um, so on the one hand, the UNHCR promoted this program as they did in Jordan as a program to enhance refugee autonomy, but then if you go and check how they manage the program and also how they, um, what they say, what, how they take stock of the program two years later, for instance, in this evaluation of the effects of cash-based cash intervention uh, on protection outcomes in Greece, they deliberately admit that this program was enforced actually for allowing refugees to cope with basic needs and that also on that level the program failed. So they say, they admit, actually we realize that uh, until now uh, they, many, many asylum seekers who benefit uh, from uh, of this program didn't manage to cope with their basic needs, right? So kind of uh, self-admittance of failure. Uh, and where in, at stake there, there are also these, only these basic needs and not, definitely not a program of uh, self-entrepreneurship and autonomy, right? Um, so the, the, some important aspect to consider, of this pro, to consider about this program is that this program implies specific disciplinary and spatial restriction to, on, on, the, on the asylum seekers. So uh, asylum seekers, at least at the beginning of when the program was launched, was launched they had to uh, accept um, to stay in the accommodation, so in the hotspot or reception center or camps, depending on uh, where the refugees were, uh, provided by the UNHCR or by the Greek autonomy, or the, the Greek authority, sorry. Um, then this, this condition slightly changed, even thanks to migrant struggles um, that took place uh, many I mean, the, over the three years. Um, so the special restriction that uh, basically were, if you want, in contradiction with this claim to autonomy, right, about where 
the refugees wanted to stay were uh, considered as quite intrusive and restrict mm, disciplinary on the part of, um, of, of the asylum seekers. Um, so this is the first point to, to notice, that these cards were given within this uh, widespread system of incarceration. Incarceration on the island, because migrants, most of them are not allowed to move, and also more broadly of uh, spatial confinement and impossibility to decide uh, where to stay. Um, so uh, building uh, on, this, uh, on this context, uh, I use here uh, the analysis of uh, economic geographer Tatiana Tieme, uh, who uh, discuss in a few articles, uh, who, inter who developed this concept of the hustling subject and hustle economy uh, to advance some insight about the production of refugee subjectivity, how they are depicted and governed as forced techno users. The hostel, TM explains, designate a condition of protracted liminality and weighted, characterized by a quote, individual's insecurity disproportionately distributed, and at the same time, constant practices of struggle and experimentation on the part of this subject. The hustling subject needs to constantly struggle and frantically move, forgetting by, and I add, forgetting access to rights. Here, I reduct such an expression to highlight how asylum seekers become forced techno user and hinder subject. Indeed, they are repeatedly obstructed in making use of humanitarian and financial support, and they constantly need to find out how rules have changed. And this is the other important aspect, to me at least, that I will discuss in the second part. So uh, this, uh, this constant obstruction is generated not only by how technology has been set uh, for uh, representing an obstacle to the refugees, but also what refugees know at the at do not know about how the system works, and even if, when they know how it works, uh, this knowledge is not sometimes very useful um, to get access to the financial support or uh, to solve a temporary problem that they might have with this technology. That is, refugees are entrapped in a panoply of technolo technological steps, so this is this paradox of on the one hand, uh, autonomy through technology, and on the other, uh, does this technology becomes compulsory, uh, are compulsory, uh, on, uh, on many, if, I mean, on many level of uh, the asylum procedure. Um, and at the same time, they are caught in a state of uncertainty as long as they need to navigate a techno-humanitarian system that constantly changes its rule and disciplinary mechanism. The images of the inner hustling subject simultaneously helps questioning linear narrative about the refugees as entrepreneurs of themselves and self-reliant refugees. Indeed, asylum seekers are expected to act as responsible techno users, so there is this fictional narrative. So they are given these prepaid cards and they are depicted as subjects who should act as if they were responsible techno users, as if they were responsible citizens, even, I mean, even if most of them will be denied of the international protection, very likely, and definitely they won't become citizen, and they will, uh, they will be excluded from the financial circuit very soon, because the other important feature of this program is that as many, fi many financial support programs for refugees, it lasts only until when these people are uh, still uh, I mean, of concern to, of the UNHCR. So until when their asylum application is under uh, process, uh, under examination, and until when, I mean, they can appeal, right, against, against the rejection in case, so they can stay within the system, but then they are out. So there is this temporariness that I think is interesting that characterizes being incorporated into a um, mechanism of data extraction uh, and also being, comp being incorporated in these financial circuits, financial humanitarian circuits, but just on a temporary uh, mode. So in the end, there is no possibility for them to, even from a liberal point of view, right, to use this, um, this, uh, this, this temporary uh, inclusion in the, in the financial system for becoming, I mean, to open, for instance, an individual bank account because the card that they are given is not associated to an individual bank account, it's just associated to the general UNHCR financial wallet. Um, so there is actually 
uh, sort of dependence that is increased and announced um, uh, between uh, the refugees and the humanitarian actors. Um, asylum seekers are, as for techno users, are hustling subject insofar as they bustle about the, tech, the techno bureaucratic steps that they need to take. So this is not specific of uh, this techno humanitarianism, if you want, but I think that this technology, on the one hand, um, highlights, help us in highlighting this obstacle, and on the other, contributed to increase these obstacles, um, and also uh, about finding how rules have changed. Uh, ad even digital platforms that are widely used on a daily basis by migrants, for instance, like WhatsApp, I mean, technological system like WhatsApp, become cumbersome technology for them uh, when these become like compulsory uh, mechanism that mediate their relationship with the humanitarian actors. Um, so to some extent, the life of asylum seeker as car beneficiary and as techno users in the hotspot is partly shaped by the interwaving of logic of care and, cont uh, and control, for sure. And yet, if on the one hand it's true that migrants are subjected to both securitization and mode of temporary relief, on the other it's worth noticing that hotspots have become sites of uh, blatant protection protracted vulnerability, so it's not even the case that migrants are object of uh, humanitarian support, right? Or is, I mean, this is precisely one of the main uh, tragic states at the moment. Um, and so, but they are turning this for techno users. Um, this, this temporariness of uh, the, 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 the cash uh, program, uh, if you want, goes together with this uh, dimension of uncertainty within which they are forced to comply with multiple bureaucratic and technological steps. So uncertainty, unlike analysis that look at how refugees are entrapped in a sort of limbo and they are just waiting, I think it's important to insist on these um, disciplinary modes that force asylum seekers to do multiple activities while they wait. They, just, they don't just wait, right? It's not an empty uh, waiting time. Um, so, just to show, I managed to, I'll, yeah. So this is uh, just two pictures um, that I took inside the, 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 the office of one of the NGOs that uh, is in charge of giving, uh, of giving these debit cards uh, to the asylum seekers and of doing this monthly verification procedure, which means every month asylum seekers need to go to the office uh, and to, up and to uh, report if their legal status, for instance, has changed or if uh, fam there are more family members in the family. So every change should be reported to the organization. And on the basis of that, uh, the e organization confirms or not confirm the payment for that month, right? So uh, how this uh, monthly verification procedure works is very uh, interesting because first, it has changed over time. So uh, during these three years, it has changed a lot. So it's very difficult to say how it works because there have been changes that have been difficult for myself as well to, to, uh, to follow, right? And uh, broadly, what is important to, uh, um, to know is that in order to do this monthly verification procedure, migrants are, uh, so migrants receive, uh, in particular on the mainland, texts on their phones about the location of the office just a few days before um, um, the, the monthly verification takes place, and also with the time of the appointment. So they need, they, they, if they lose, for instance, their phone or they, if they change number, it mean, becomes a real problem. And uh, what happens if they, for instance, if they have a technical problem with their cards because their card is temporarily blocked or if they digit the wrong PIN number, is that they can communicate with the NGOs and with the UNHCR only via uh, WhatsApp and Viber. Then it was Viber only, and so it changed. Um, but anyway, Viber and WhatsApp are the main technological channels, uh, fourth uh, channels uh, that, that migrants need to use. So what happens is that this, on, on the one hand, okay, there is this general rule, you have to use this uh, technology. On the other, what happens in reality is that this technology have been set in a way 
that constitute a real obstacle for, for the migrants. So this paper says that if a migrant, uh, a card beneficiary, send multiple messages to Viber, these, ma these messages go immediately at the bottom of the queue. So it's a for, sort of punitive measure. In this way, migrants who are particularly anxious and who send their request of, I mean, because their card doesn't work multiple times, their response is automatically delayed, right? Um, and the reason, and they can send these messages to these numbers, depending on their language. There is also a helpline, so a phone number, but I've, as I've been told by the NGOs, even if they call this number, most of the time nobody answers, right? So the only way is actually to uh, text uh, through Viber or eventually through WhatsApp in this specific range of time. Um, and uh, so uh, the explanation, the official explanation provided both by the UNHCR and by these NGOs is that they, in, they have multiplied all these, uh, these, uh, these technological obstacles and also associated with this uneven temporar temporality. So they, they just received the text, they don't know when, but it will be just a few days in advance, and at some point another text uh, with the location in order to avoid that migrants gather outside the office and that they can organize and struggle. So there is this um, potential disruption that migrants might cause and it's important, I think, to politicize all this implementation of technology in light of how this technology is used as a mode of control, not because migrants as such are trapped individually, um, but because they are controlled as a group and as a potential mob, if you want, of people who can uh, organize protests or just that can disrupt the function of the system. Um, so this, this, the way in which this technology has been set, I think, is, should be situated within a broader um, functioning of the political technology of uh, the asylum and of this, uh, in order to look at how these digital disruptions are far from being just technological technical jams, right, but are part of this attempt to physically and, uh, and, and also uh, with administrative, an administrative, through administrative measure block the, and, and, and decelerate, uh, disrupt the access to uh, the, asylum, uh, the asylum system. Um, so Migrants are preventively disciplined as potential mobs and at the same time they are governed through a multiplicity of scattered temporal deadlines and rules that they need to abide to. This mix of technotemporal mandatory steps generate a widespread disorientation among the migrants. Um, so there is this, uh, this um, condition of being entrapped into uh, uh, compulsory technological steps to take but also movements to make. So this state of uncertainty uh, as I said, force them to become hypermobile and to understand really at the level of sites where they have to uh, go and also at the same time to understand, to constantly be updated about how this, uh, how very small uh, change happen <coughs> in the way in which technology are set, in the criteria for instance. And this is extremely difficult because many of these criteria are not uh, changed on the paper, so they are changed in practice. And other times, it's very difficult in the, in the end to know, right, about this change. Um, so this question of, um, of, the, of the knowledge of uh, what refugees know, and also even if they know how the system works, how such a knowledge might turn out to be uh, pointless in order to get access to rights, uh, is quite uh, visible uh, if, we, if we focus on on, um, on the cash assistance program, and as I said, on this broad, more broadly on this, um, on this panoply of technology. Uh, so I think that so in, in, there, there has been also in this case, a, a, there is a literature in migration studies about uh, the knowledge and the non-knowledge used by states and the production of ignorance used by state for controlling migrants and for governing migrants better. Uh, but in my opinion, this uh, is not the whole point. So it's not only that states deliberately or, uh, or in an involuntary way, so all this debate about voluntariness or 
uh, involuntary way of implementing, enforcing ignorance, I think is a bit of a trap because it depends when you say intentionality, who is the actor that you have in mind. In this case, there is a multiplicity of actors. Uh, many of these have also conflicting interests among them. Um, well, to me, it's more interesting to uh, notice how, uh, in order to obstruct uh, uh, the access to asylum and the access to uh, rights, um, refugees are affected, shaped by this uh, constant disorientation that, in part, consists in uh, partial non-knowledge of the system, uh, not because there is no transparency. So this is the, the point that... Uh, is not a claim for more transparency. Uh, most of the time the UNHCR explained very well on its website how the cash system program works, uh, but of changes and the unevenness of change. And on the other hand, because even if when refugees know, the system might function in a different way. So um, these uncertain, the, the focus on uncertainty helps in um, shifting the attention from the eventual ignorance and no knowledge produced by the states towards the way in which migrants are affected by that. And, um, and to look at what uh, Miranda Freaker called epistemic injustice that um, uh, migrants, not only migrants, but I think it applies to uh, migrants very well, are affected by. So this uh, no knowledge uh, is also the result of the discredit of uh, the refugees' speech, but also of the refugees' conducts and behavior in their use of technology. So um, at the level of uh, speech, uh, most of the time, they, I mean, the, the authorities and the NGOs do not believe when migrants argue, yeah, but, well, it's not, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't try to dodge the system and to get the financial support twice in a month, right? Um, so there is this that is very common in the, in, the, uh, in the asylum system in general, also during the, the asylum application, the asylum interview. Uh, so there is this epistemic injustice at stake. Even if you know, your knowledge cannot be actualized. It's, not, it's unhelpful. But also the level of conducts. So um, as many NGOs reported, migrants use the cards in order to cheat the system and to t uh, try to take the payment twice in a month or to give a card for their friends, and so on. Um, so in, uh, in this paper that I'm currently develop, uh, developing, I try to combine uh, the analysis by uh, Michel Foucault and also by uh, authors that uh, build on Foucault to explain this uh, lack of credibility um, towards refugees. Um, so at the level of epistemic injustice and um, the, 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 the discourse the untrue discourse that refugees are supposed to, um, to give any time, with uh, ana the analysis of Franz Fanon about uh, the condition of the colonized subject that is not only considered a subject who lies, but also a subject whose behaviors and movements and conducts and bodies uh, are suspect and are uh, constitutively uh, there for cheating uh, the system. Right? So... Uh, this, uh, this unpredictability is uh, um, at the same time a way for, uh, for governing uh, migrants and uh, the way in which migrants, I mean the condition in which migrants find themselves and, and, and strategically mobilize for uh, uh, coming to grips with this, uh, with this uh, uneven, um, uneven functioning of uh, technology. So migrants as car beneficiary and forced techno users are governed through the production of unlegible techno humanitarian assemblages made of disciplinary rules that are frantically changed over time. I speak about the production of unlegible mechanism of government as these do not consist only in a lack of transparency and legibility. Rather, they are actively made not legible or hardly legible. Uh, because the risk, I think, of just pointing to uh, the opacity of this, I mean, criteria is that we turn, we end up in saying, okay, well, we need to be more transparent. The UNHCR should write uh, more transparent and more clear uh, documents. Um, but the point is that this, the, the, the refugee system per se is predicated upon these ambiguities and this uh, opacity 
that are not necessarily uh, narrow to uh, the information that migrants might receive or not receive. So even if the migrants receive the information, this information might be uh, assembled in a way that turn out to be uh, useless to the migrants or in the end, uh, the access to that specific service might be denied to the migrants on the basis of small exception, right? Um, so uh, the obstruction that migrants uh, in using the services provided by humanitarian actors uh, face are not accidental disruption nor technical jams and failures. On the contrary, the constellation of technologies that migrants uh, need to navigate actively hampers the access to the channels of the asylum as well as to the financial and humanitarian support. So uh, as part of that, asylum seekers who are turned into forced techno user, users do also need to keep themselves up to date about the frantic changes and disciplinary rules and bureaucratic steps they need to take. The reiterated production of unlegible um, techno-disciplinary rules are constitutive, of com constitutive components of ways of governing through disorienting. And I think that in the face of this, it's very important to um, ask ourselves, um, okay, what, what do we do in the face of this um, disorientation uh, and uncertainty, which is announced by this, uh, through these technologies, uh, without ending up in a liberal statement towards, uh, for more transparency, right? Precisely because it's a political technology which is predicated upon the, in particular, more and more. So the channels of the asylum are actively obstructed um, by uh, European uh, uh, countries. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, we need to question this securitization and humanitarization, victimization of migration within a more nuanced analysis of the multiple obstruction um, and the multiple forms of data and value extraction that these, uh, these technology are source of. So the migrants is there not only as someone to be saved or someone to be, um, to be prote protected from, but also as a surface of uh, value and data extraction. Um, and these modes of extraction are really, I mean, at the core of uh, this political economy of asylum that uh, is particularly visible if we look at this techno multi multiplication of technologies. And the second thing is that in the face of this disorientation experience by, um, uh, by migrants, um, we need, I think, that uh, more attention to, uh, to how refugees are, uh, the way in which refugees are affected uh, by this par partial no knowledge might help in uh, reformulating a critical discourse which start from uh, the, 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 the obstacles uh, that migrants face in accessing asylum and also how to cope with this uncertainty without aiming at uh, a streamlined uh, refugee system, right? So how refugees themselves strategically use this uncertainty, but also how politically um, we can, I mean, this is a, an open question, we can face such an uncertainty without uh, claiming more transparency and more, I mean, clear uh, rules in a moment when these clear rules are clearly set for excluding uh, migrants. All right, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, now we will hear from Brenna. Okay, um, I'm, just, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, Martina. Um, thanks so much for that uh, really uh, engaging paper, and it's, it's a really fascinating area of research. Um, so I guess one question, uh, a first question is about um, the relationship between this mode of governing and disciplining and producing subjects, in this case the refugee or asylum seeker subject, and, um, and, and modes of governing non-refugee people. Because as you were describing this system, of course I was thinking a lot about something like universal credit, you know, which is a system that was brought in using a lot of different kind of digital technologies to um, to create obstacles to people um, 
you know, surviving, in fact, right? So, um, you know, we know that the system of universal credit and, and the, um, the, the, and the technological forms which force or, you know, people are forced into using um, to obtain benefits um, has also produced a level of, um, uh, you know, um, insecurity, disorientation, et cetera, that, uh, that um, it, it sounds, I'm not trying to draw a parallel, but, but it, it was evocative of that, your paper. And so I guess the question is, um, is it the digital technology per se or the rationality underlying it? And uh, I don't think, I think that's a different question than, than the epistemic questions and the questions of knowledge that you raised in the second part of the paper. I think, I'm wondering about the rationality that underlies the use of these specific technological forms um, that you know, produce such impossibility in the day-to-day -day lives of people, you know, to the point where they, where they, you know, it, it presents an obstacle to surviving, in fact. So, so that's one question. Um, yet, we know that people subvert these technologies in order to survive. So I wanted to ask about, you know, in your research, how have you found um, asylum seekers, um, you know, getting around, is there, is there any way of getting around the use of these technologies or, I mean, I mean, we know in any oppressive system people refuse and resist and get around things and come up with other ways of, you know, getting money or getting food or getting shelter. And so I was wondering about that, you know, the kind of resistance to, to this um, uh, oppressive techno-humanitarianism. Um, another question I had was about the issue of spatial restriction. So, the you know the the scene that you described. So, in you know you're you're in a camp or you're on an island, and then you are further you have a further spatial fix fixedness or or restriction, which is um, you know given effect through the use of these, you know, what, di digital technologies, right? And, and it reminded me, though, in a way, and I wondered whether there's a similarity in the political economy of digital technologies in the refugee camp and the political economy and use of, of digital technologies in the prison. You know, there's been some work done. Well, I mean, I'm not a prison study scholar, but I think there's been quite a lot of work done on... Um, the use of particular companies to provide certain technologies that are used that, that limit the way in which inmates can, for instance, make telephone calls or, you know, that, that there's a kind, I wonder if there's any parallels to be drawn. And then I also wonder about the political economy of this infrastructure. So you mentioned banks as being um, some of the financial actors who are going to who are profiting off of this, um, but I wonder about tech companies, big tech. Um, you know, I, I I mean all of the different corporate actors who are exploiting these systems of captivity um, for profit. So I guess a question about the political economy of the of these of the infrastructure of the digital technologies in, in specifically in spaces of confinement. Um, another question I had um, was about the idea of temporariness and this dimension of uncertainty that you spoke about um, and how these digital technologies because they're changing all of the time or, or, or their modes of operation are changing and shifting, that this contributes to a sense of disorientation and, and uncertainty in a situation that's already of profound instability and uncertainty. Um, and again, I guess I wondered, um, well, I guess a, a couple of questions follow from that. So. One question is how do the burdens of the digital technology, because it sounds like this is, you know, it's not just obstacles, but it's, 
imposing huge burdens on people to, you know, they have to navigate all this stuff to access basic um, things like cash. But how do the burdens of the digital technology distract refugees from other, from doing other things with their time? Um, and I was wondering if you've noticed a shift in that. So, you know, just at the very kind of mundane, everyday level. Um, and then I also wondered in terms of um, this disorientation and what you called the techno-temporality, I guess I wanted to ask how this sits with or differs from other kinds of refugee temporalities, right? So, I mean, I was thinking a lot about the kind of disorientation that a lot of Palestinians living in exile or, or Palestinian refugees have written about for decades, which has nothing to do with technologies, right? That there's just this fundamental disorientation that is produced through being in, in, in exile or, or being a, a refugee. And, um, and that, you know, all of these things are legal, are, fix, are fictive constructions. Like, you know, the, the techno-temporality is a, is a fiction or is fictive. The, the idea of the absentee owner, you know, is, is a fiction. These are all kind of fictive temporalities that are imposed on refugees. And, I mean, I could go on about the property aspect of that, right? Because, I mean, in a way, there's a... There's a part of this disorientation is produced by being in an environment where you don't have access to any kind of normal property relation, right? And property relations give us fixed temporalities. If you have a lease, if you're a tenant, if you are an owner, I mean, you know, so this, 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 uh, reality of being dispossessed of your home, you know, I think produces like a foundational and fundamental kind of temporal disorientation. So I'm wondering how the techno-temporal sits with these other modes of temporal and spatial disorientation. Um, and then I guess a last question is around um, how these technologies interfere with the legal framework because you, you mentioned that these technologies um, basically create an obstacle to accessing one's rights. And I was wondering, are there legal technologies at play? I mean, are, are refugees also forced to make their claims using different technologies? I mean, I remember with Lorenzo and Charles's work years ago in terms of mapping migrant deaths, for instance, they were using a lot of sophisticated technologies, but when the lawyer came in to try and start bringing legal challenges, she needed people to go to the refugees and put down with pen and paper their oral testimony. Like, you know, I'm just wondering whether, you know, again, is there a big disjuncture between the kind of digital technologies and then the, is, is the legal framework that the refugees have to deal with still pretty analog or, you know, what, what is the interface between those two worlds? So those are, those are the questions that your paper provoked for me. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to come back right away? Or uh, well, you can also, I don't mind. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can come back in the course of the questions. All right, so uh, we're ready to open up for questions. Uh, please raise your hand to indicate if you have a question. We have Robin Mikes. So, yeah, the first one is just up there. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting, and I look forward to read your paper on that. I had a question when you talk about the... This kind of dichotomy that happens in migrant studies about securitization versus victimization and then uh, seeing migrants as a threat versus as a victim that are, you know, that just make us feel pity about them. But you said that most of the time they're rather seen as a burden that needs to be managed. And I was thinking, if this is not a question of surveillance capitalism on how to track migrants and their finance in order to actually have more control over them, it might, uh, I was thinking that maybe it, it might be something about not humanitarianism, but rather the 
dehumanization. I don't know how to say that. Dehuman yeah, it's dehumanizing, but it's like the process of dehumanizing <laughs> of a crisis. Because I feel like when finance and technology become the substitutes for humans and institutions as a medium, then you're also not taking the agency out of it and having no one responsible for that. But at the same time, you're taking all the human part out of it and making it more an inhuman issue, something that doesn't need human to be dealt with. So my question was that, because I think you mentioned at some spot that at some time that it's not about tracking uh, migrants because there are other ways to do that, especially with the prepaid card. So is it maybe a way of actually getting rid of responsibility and at the same time putting the burden into technology and not the institutions? So yeah, I think it was that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just up there. Hi, um, this was really interesting because I also worked on Lesbos Island and then later in Athens. Um, as far as I know, once um, refugees or asylum seekers are granted asylum, this ca cash assistance is gone. So, um, so one of the questions is like, have you ever looked at this process as well? Like what happens? when, you know, somebody's granted asylum and then loses um, this cash assistance program. And also, in my observations, um, there was a difference between men and women's um, allowance. Like, men were getting, I think, 120 euros and women 90 euros. So there was this gender gap, um, as far as I remember, especially when I was on Lesbos. And also, like, with the new government now in Greece, um, I think, um, again, this um, cash card system is going to change. So with like all of these things also you know, changing and happening, um, how can we be sure about that you know, this technology is really um, you know, away from all this politics and you know, how they want to manage men and women separately um, in terms of like, theorizing the, the, the whole role of this cash card. Um, I mean, I think we need to problematize that a little bit more. And uh, did you also speak to any of the refugees? What was the process of like using this technology? Like what it meant to them and what was doing to them in their everyday lives? Um, so, like, how was it operationalized in the everyday life of the refugees? Because for me, they were experiencing this emptiness and void in the whole, in the day. And this cash card thing was happening, I don't know, once a month or so. So they would just go and get the money. So I think we cannot deny, like, this whole void happening in refugees' everyday lives um, while they're waiting. Thank you. Um, we can take one more question this round, if you indicate with your hand. Oh, sorry, I missed you. Yeah, just over there. Hi, this is following up on those who actually think it's very dehumanizing as well. Um, and uh, I'm curious, very basic administrative kind of question. How are the tech and the financial services that are going to be used how are those decided upon? Who decides who gets, if it's Viber or it's WhatsApp or it's Skype or whatever? Um, and if an asylum seeker, I know it might be um, unlikely, but if they don't use the money because at that moment they get processed or something, do they get to keep anything? Do they get to transfer it into an account or anything like that? Do you know of any formal way that people get together to make formal savings? or do they just do it informally as like um, group cash plans or something like that? And do you know if the personal information gets collected for tracking? Thank you. Um, would you like to come back yeah. now to those questions and Brenna's? Okay, so I start from Brenna's question. Thanks a lot for this for the engagement with the paper. <laughs> and yeah, there are many things that I, I didn't mention in this talk that I, I mean, I've written about in another paper about the, the actual functioning of the Kashgar system because here I, today I wanted to focus more on this broader um, technological constellation. But so let's start with 
the question of um, the, uh, um, temporariness. So temporariness and certainty, yeah, definitely. So uh, what I want to say as a general comment is that in, indeed I, I, I take a distance from analysis that look at this uh, techno-humanitarianism as a big shift and that look at these techno-humanitarian assemblages as a kind of, uh, I mean, through techno optimism lens, right? So I don't think that we can look at this technology as a, like a radical shift. In this sense, I think that this, the, the, the actual <coughs> functioning of um, as I, the asylum system through technologies and on the one hand, shed light on how this uncertainty is constantly reproduced and mm -hmm. that you can also find elsewhere. So I don't mm -hmm. think that there is necessarily, I totally agree, you will find elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so these people in exile and definitely is not something peculiar to Greece or Jordan. I think that, however, many of these analyses about uh, waiting and uncertainty uh, to me are miss, miss something about, okay, how these uh, status of waiting is actually not empty. Okay, then I will come back to your point about emptiness. But mm. is, uh, there is emptiness, there is sense of, okay, I don't know how to really, uh, what to do, how to kill time, right? Uh, even in Greece, the migrants say this. But how actually this is not totally empty because migrants are forced to make multiple tasks. So, and this technological proliferation definitely force them to be more hypermobile and to be, so it doesn't streamline their life, right? On the contrary, they are more forced to do things while at the same time they are completely entrapped in this state of uncertainty yeah. because they have to wait anyway. Mm -hmm. They don't know when they will. So, mm -hmm. um, so the fictive temporality is definitely, I don't think is a characteristic of Greece or in general of this technology. But I can see, for instance, the difference in this sense, I think, com in this specific case, comparative approach might be helpful. So with Italy, where there are no technologies at all in, at, in the level of financial support, and there is this big problem of, um, I mean, uh, uncertainty there is really, uh, does really materialize in this long waiting time mm -hmm. that migrants just uh, kill by trying to be <laughs> exploited by employers who hire them mm -hmm. on a temporary basis. Uh, but there is definitely not this forced, uh, in, this forced interaction with technology in Italy. So they're very basic system of receiving cash. Mm -hmm. uh, and, this is, uh, and this is the other point that I don't want through this. So in this paper and also in, in another paper I published on this, uh, my, my temporary conclusion is that we, we, should, we shouldn't um, analyze all this by saying, so are these cars good or bad, right? Yeah. Because definitely uh, car migrants are happy to get these cards and this, this financial support. Um, and also, yeah, they are forced to, to do all this task, but in the end, unlike in Italy, they are more sure that they will have this, I mean, a set, that financial support is set, is 90 uh, euros per month if they receive foods in camps is 150 that if they don't receive foods in, in, in the food in camp. So uh, it's definitely uh, not a question of um, is, is, uh, is better or worse. Yeah. And this uh, leads me to the other point. So you said, you said this oppressive technology, how migrants get around. <coughs> so I think that this is, to me, the most difficult probably <coughs> question, not you know, I can mention you know, how migrants try to cheat the system to put in the UNHCR's term, but I don't think that these technologies are actually oppressive mm. because these are technology that are also, this is the twofold, I mean, the, the ambivalent dimension. These are technologies that refugees want because the, the prepaid cards in particular means money, even if it's a very small amount, but they say, okay, this is the only thing that uh, helps us in these moments, so, uh, in particular because they, I mean, most, most of them do not find any kind of even a job in, in, the, mm. on the, in the black economy. And also these other, these WhatsApp, Viber, Skype, most of them don't see them, this technology as a problem of, in terms of surveillance. Some yeah. of them are, I mean, they, they are suspicious about technologies, but most of them, they just really want to get this access to these cars and their real, I mean, uh, problems is to, to, 
to, to get the money and that most of the t many times they are excluded for multiple reasons from that. So there is this, uh, to me, this problem of how do we reformulate a critical analysis of this technology if first migrants need to deal with technology if they want to get access to the asylum. So yeah. the Skype system might consider, yeah, a trap, but I mean, it's the way for them for, to get access to their right to apply at least, yeah. and on the other end, to the cars yeah. that they really want. So mm -hmm. it is complicated, uh, the question of do migrants want to, uh, I mean, escape or dodge this technology? No, actually not. It's not like the fingerprint. Right. Uh, that has a direct implication <coughs> on their movement. But it's interesting because most people in the world don't see those technologies as a form of oppressive surveillance, right? But they are. I mean, you know, so yeah. it, it is interesting about bringing refugees or asylum seekers into the same surveillance, someone mentioned surveil surveillance infrastructure that the rest of us are yeah. in all the time without any, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and perhaps there are different, so uh, when you really want to apply for asylum, your main goal is that one, right? You maybe mm. don't mind that if you are also monitored. Also because, as I said, they are monitored since the beginning, since when they land, and the fingerprint is the most violent form of technology. Yeah, sure. Because then they are blocked, basically. Mm. So, yeah, definitely there, are, there have been, at least at the beginning, when the, the system, because it's like this, the system is like many cases with the border regime, very much reactive. So because of migrant struggles and migrant strategies, they have, the UNHCR has been able to set the system in a way that makes more more difficult for migrants to cheat it, right? Mm. So at the beginning, they ma many managed to get <coughs> the financial support in 2017 twice, and they jumped from one camp to another and mm. managed to, because there was not a central database. Now there is, so it's more difficult to to, to do this. Um, another thing that some people mentioned to me is that if your friend uh, escaped to Macedonia and uh, for a few days, so in the days when there is the monthly verification, when the, the UNHR gives the, the, the financial support, you can take the card, so there is a way to take the cards of your friend without, even if the friends left so in principle, he is no longer eligible for the cash assistance, but it's just a question of, I mean, if they, they, they manage in this small uh, leeway of time. Um, so special restriction and, yeah, prison study, yeah, thanks a lot, I think is very important also because the, yeah, the island are, as you said, I mean, a prison per se. Um, yeah, again, I, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's, I prefer to speak about control in the sense that it's a control over migrant lives in general, but this surveillance, so for instance, I had the opportunity to, uh, to see what the UNHCR can see in real time. It is, but so they just see where migrants take the money from, right, and where they move. If this happens in the country, if they take, try to pay outside Greece, mm -hmm. the card is immediately blocked. Mm -hmm. But the point is that both the UNHCR and the Greek authorities and the European, they don't really want to track these migrants too much because mm -hmm. if the migrants leave, the implicit uh, <laughs> goal is that, I mean, uh, more and more migrants manage to leave Greece on the sly without, so there is a, also a whole battle on over numbers between the UNHCR and the Greek authorities in order to declare how many people benefit from this system. Yeah. And, and, and in order, because they, they in order to receive money from the European Union. So this surveillance, um, the, the, what I don't know, and I, I'm, I've been trying to understand this, is then what, how this data that is collected, that is, this is related to your question, um, at the moment of the registration in the cash assistance program and during the monthly verification, how it is shared <laughs> and not shared among actors. So it's a very complicated infrastructure of data circulation. So the UNHR is basically the main, uh, the main actor that manages the whole system and has access to both database, the database of the bank, and the database progress, which is the, the database of the UNHR itself. The NGO, has, they both have access to, partially to these two databases, but in the database of the bank, there are only minimal information and not information about, for instance, the legal status of the person. So there, the bank, 
which is a bank based in London, and this is interesting, it's not a Greek bank, so it's a kind of an example of uh, externalization of asylum within Greece, so Greek authorities are only marginally involved, the bank is in London, and the UNHCR uh, manage the whole system and the European Commission gives the money. And the bank, from what, I, what they told me when I interviewed them, is that they don't even see these people, as, these migrants, as potential future clients because they know that they will be denied of protection or even if they, are, they will stay in Europe, they say, to me, yeah, but these are poor people. They will, who, who knows if they will be able to open a bank account because in the end the money cannot be transferred to a proper bank account. So this is the, the point that um, they lose the, the amount of money if they don't spend. So there is this idea of the migrants as self-entrepreneur is really... Sorry, um, no, 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 that's, no, 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 um, so quiet. To universal credit, yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot for this, and I think yeah, this is um, the, the, one of the research directions to to carry on. So uh, to me it's quite relevant that this program has been enforced in Greece where, I mean, where there, is, there has been a huge economic crisis and how this system has been set also taking into account the level of the minimum wage of the Greek people. Uh, so in order not to create this competition between the Greek and the refugees, uh, because that there have been many complaints on the part of uh, the Greek, uh, in particular, in mean, specific site, and so I, I think that is this is very interesting to 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 reorient to to expand this research beyond uh, the field of refugee per se and to see how this measure to me is an interesting like site of experimentation how the, it is used on refugees and how similar measures have been used elsewhere. Although um, there are also specificity in the sense that. This financialization, I use this term, but I think is also a bit inappropriate in relation to humanitarianism because then if we go and see how this uh, credit work is really, so they have just this prepaid card that is totally dependent on the UNHCR giving them the money. So it's like the same cash system that we have in other countries like in France, in Italy, and that is mediated through this card. So it doesn't it's, not, it's nothing similar, for instance, to microcredit, right? So yeah. it's, they don't really enter any financial independent system. Mm. Um, and then, what else? Um, ah, legal technology. Yeah, so the, the, the most important thing to notice is this Skype system that is really not beyond, even if they don't want to be registered for the cash system program, they need to use Skype. Uh -huh. And this was implemented in 2016. Uh -huh. And as far as I know, it's only in Greece. So in Italy, there is not such a measure. And it's compulsory. And this creates a long waiting queue because uh, there are only certain times when migrants, depending on the nationality, they can uh, call. And I've been trying to understand <laughs> On the, because in principle everything is transparent on the UNHCR website, but in reality the rules of the time slot change over time. When you, if, I mean, if you are a, a Pakistani national, you can call, and and also how, I mean, which days of the of the week and so on. So it's a super complicated system. So this mediate and I think change the way, the way in which, the, the, but definitely I agree with you. Then is in the end is the. So on the one hand, there is this financial slash humanitarian support, and on the other, there is the legal, the legal, I mean, the legal process, the sense of how they can get the asylum, which is, however, mediated by the Skype that yeah. trigger many protests on the part of refugees who ask to be, I mean, to, to that the, the Greek, this is are the Greek authorities who implemented this, right? That that they stop to use this system uh, because it's a real burden. Uh, however, these, uh, I think the two are connected because then this cash system is connected to the accommodation system. So migrants who receive the refugee status are in principle in six months excluded both from the accommodation, which is connected to the asylum procedure, yeah. uh, and from the cash system. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, in reality, uh, there are many exceptions and, uh, and also differences in uh, in terms of when migrants are excluded. Um, 
and then uh, on the question of so no there are no there is no difference between men and women the the the, the monthly payment is 90 euros if they receive food in camps or 150 if they don't and for families is different depending on family members um, but I definitely agree that there is this so not only because there is a new government but even if you uh, read how the European Commission justifies the world program. The, there is uncertainty also in this implementation of the system. So the Greek authorities were supposed to take over uh, the world program in 2018. Then it was postponed to 2019. And, it, and, and they are still, I mean, the, the, the UNHCR is still managing uh, the world procedure, right? The world uh, program. So uh, who will take, we will uh, be in charge of the cash assistance program is, it's really um, one of the political stakes at the moment because the European Commission declared that the refugee crisis is basically over in Greece. So they try to, uh, to uh, hand over to the Greek, but uh, this is a big issue because that, the, the money comes from the European Commission, right? Unlike in Italy. So this is also the big difference between Italy and Greece. Um, that Greece has this, I mean, European-funded program. Um, then victimization, security, surveillance. Yeah, I, definitely there is, a, I agree with you, this um, getting rid of responsibility and also this creating a physical distance. And um, this is what they also say, the, the UNHCR officer, we, in this way we avoid to have these crowds, right, of migrants who want to take cash and... Uh, it might be dangerous and inhumanization precisely in this sense, this technopolitics that put a distance between them and, and their humanitarian actors. At the same time, and this is connected to what also Bren asked, um, all this technological infrastructure then most of the time fail and so the paper is still the main uh, vehicles for uh, these humanitarian actors to register, for instance, uh, during the monthly verification procedure, right, we, the, there are so many problems, technical problems, for, for instance, that they are not able, the UNHR, to update their database, and they keep writing on the paper. So th this is a absolutely, uh, so then this human clash cannot be avoided, <laughs> despite what they uh, want, also because refugees struggle a lot. They put their presence, physical <coughs> presence, at the core, uh, struggling against the their exclusion from the program, and so on. And also because that there are <coughs> so many technological gems that are due not only to I mean, technical problems, but also to um, conflicts among the actors involved, right? So uh, how the UNHR wants to manage the system and what the, the fact that Greek authorities in part want to get access to this data that, uh, so they don't have direct access to the data collected by the UNHR. Um, I, again, I don't know if the point is surveillance capitalism. I think there is, to me, this uh, angle of extraction is interesting as a way for not overcoming but complicating the, the, the this securitization, victimization, because the refugees are there. And as this is also another question that Bren asked, so that there is this uh, I mean, involvement of private actors and uh, high tech companies that. Uh, irrespective of control of uh, migrants per se, so they are not so much interested in monitoring you uh, as an individual, but they take data and what they are doing, for instance, the UNHCR is producing these <laughs> statistics about refugees as consumers, right? Um, so MasterCard is part of this game, so is a, the MasterCard logo is on. Um, and I'm trying to understand the role of um, the, 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 how is it called, uh, windows so that UNHR use in this uh, mediation with the, the progress database. Um, and these are not, me, because this is related to the economy of knowledge, there are so many, diff, uh, so many people involved in this program, who manage the program, and most of them have no idea of how this data is used. Um, I think I yeah. No, absolutely. No, 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 not that. But um, to get some more questions in. So, do we have? We're going to have to uh, finish quite soon. But do we have any last questions on this subject? 
I'll give you a second to contemplate. I think I have like a follow-up question from what you were about to say. I, I was yeah. thinking that it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking that all the parallels that exist between how mig migrants are governed, but also how you know non-migrant citizens are governed, especially in the West with the infrastructure of surveillance capitalism. Do you think that maybe this kind of like force uh, pushing into the te into technology it's uh, some sort of like to purge, so like to create like a force assimilation into the system? I don't know if I'm explaining myself because it was like a crazy idea I got. So there's a structure that we all are part of, which is, you know, surveillance capitalism to an extent. And the fact that migrants are now kind of being pushed into it, is it because those who actually make it past are forced into assimilation into the system as well? Like some sort of purge. When you put technology as a medium, then you have to be, at, I mean, you have to know how to use technology, but also how to go on with it to be part of it. So putting that as an obstacle, it's also a way of purging people who might not assimilate as good as others. Yeah, yeah I think we, we okay. uh, one second. Sorry. Any very last questions? This is your last chance. No? Okay. No, I think, back. yeah, in part you're right. Uh, also because uh, what I didn't say is that um, asylum seekers are asked to give feedback about the, the use of their cards, and so they are like, they, the, the UNHR might call them, right, randomly, and say, what is your experience? And there is a whole questionnaire of, question, uh, of yeah, points, questions that they might be asked. And this data, this extraction of knowledge, if you want, is used by the UNHR itself. So there is this idea, you participate to your own detention, to your own governmentality, basically. Um, and is it, so this non-violent mode of co-opting the migrants themselves um, and by uh, telling them, look, you are a, like a consumer, right? You are a, like a citizen who can contribute to, to, to tell us what you think about the functioning of, of the system. All right. Uh, please join me in thanking the speakers.